So this morning you had an opportunity to have a brief encounter uh, with Lacey Robinson. Lacey currently serves as the Chief Engagement Officer for Unbound Ed. She has more than 20 years in education, experience in education as an educator, a principal, and staff development specialist with a focus on literacy, equity, and school leadership. As the Senior Director of Engagement, Lacey designs and conducts professional development sessions focused on school and district leadership, change management, as well as effective implementation strategies. In fact, I believe she's an equity warrior. Previously, Lacey was the Senior Director of Implementation for the National Transforming Teams Program at New Leaders, a nonprofit that trains aspiring and current school leaders. Lacey is certified in facilitative leadership and has served as a, as a staff development specialist, both nationally and internationally, most recently working with the Medical School of Rwanda on organizational and change management. I know we are so grateful that she is here with us today in the Queen City. If you can please give a warm welcome to Miss Lacey Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. Is this on? Yes. And I really don't need it because my <laughs> mouth is big. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, some of y'all are just finishing up wiping the chicken grease off your face. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, that was a wonderful lunch, um, and I'm here to tell you that this is not a sit and get. We're going to do some talking, some thinking, and some planning in this room. So if you're not a techie, you need to pull out a piece of paper and an apparatus to jot some things down. If you are a techie, you need to pull up an app, a page, something to write some things down. Every time someone goes over my resume, I cringe. I lie a little bit. It's over 20 years, but you know. <laughs> but I start to flash back in those moments where I sat in the seats that you all are, and I had to dip in and out of conversations and thoughts as people were presenting things. Some things were relevant, some things weren't. Uh, but I remember those moments where I was captivated by what was said in that moment and then would go back to my building and get captivated by my secretarial staff and get captivated by my parents and oftentimes I didn't allow myself to go back and reflect so I'm going to hold us accountable today to have some reflection and some reminders do you think you can do that yes. okay tell, tell your neighbor I'm holding you accountable, holding you accountable. Okay. all right in case, uh, <laughs> let me explain to you a little bit about my style. Surprise, surprise, I'm an African-American woman. Uh, I grew up in Ohio, as I said earlier, and I grew up in a very traditional African-American home uh, where I had the opportunity to attend uh, a Baptist church. So I do a lot of call and response. And for some of you who don't know who that is, that is, a, that is an interplay between me and you, right? Okay, so um, I am going to ask you to do some call and response. I'm going to ask you to talk to your neighbor. And most importantly, I'm going to ask to reflect on yourself today. So I have the honor and the privilege of working at Unbound Ed. We are an organization that is uh, a little over four years old, but that is comprised of probably more than 40 years of expertise combined. We are a group of leaders, uh, school teachers, curriculum writers, uh, some folks have worked in policy and assessment, um, but we are absolutely lovers of learning, and we are called to the social justice movement that is currently happening in and outside of our schoolhouses. And so we are committed in seeing not just educational equity, but the dismantling of the systems that our very systems were created around. That's right, tell your neighbor, she about to go there. <laughs> Get ready. Our discussion this afternoon, some of you, and it's okay, you're gonna feel like your toes are stepped on, that's okay. 
I'm going to say some things this afternoon that some of you are going to really grapple with. Some of you are going to be very angry. That's okay. I'm used to meeting people in the parking lot. <laughs> These heels can be kicked off. I know how to run. <laughs> but I'm having the, I want to have this conversation with you this afternoon because we are at a pinnacle point in the United States. All of my historians in the room, if you track what is actually going on in our country, this is not something new. This wheelhouse has turned back around and we are now back at the point where our grandparents and our parents were experiencing some of the same things that we and our children are experiencing today. And so if we're not careful, history will repeat itself. And it'll be 20 years down the road and there'll be someone else Maybe not as loud as me, as me, maybe doesn't curse as much as I do, but we'll be standing up on the stage looking across at some educators talking about the same things that we're about to have a conversation. And I want to respectfully submit to you that we don't allow that to happen. And in order for that not to happen, we have to have these conversations, okay? Okay? Okay. okay. I'm just making sure you're all here. Um, well, let me make sure this is on. Is it on? I don't mind asking for help. There it is. So in order to set the foundation, I always start wherever I go around the data. And I mean, what I'm about to show you, what we're about to look at, I'm sure nobody in this room um, is going to say, I've never, I didn't know this, I've never seen this before. The data is centered around, uh, let's start with national data what Nate tells us about uh, eighth grade mathematics and the average scores. And without me even having the key, I bet some of you can already decipher who's a plus and who's a circle. Who's a plus? You say, say that again? Students of color. Who's the circle? Say it loud and proud, that's okay. White. Yes, students of color, African-American students, and white students. Because in the United States, we can look at just about any academic data and we can predict what that data is going to look like according to race. Am, am I wrong? No. Oh, y'all in trouble today. <laughs> this morning as I sat through and heard Clayton, Clayton and Brian present and uh, there were some things that they sort of laid out on the table and I saw people sit really still. and and. I want to tell you that you're going to have to loosen up because in order for us not to continue to see this data, we have got to have these conversations. All right. This is eighth grade reading scores. Pluses are African American, circles are. And by the way, I just want to tell you that our White students are faring well, but they're not really where they should be. And so when I look at data like this all the time, I say in the United States, right, our white students have a cold when it comes to eighth grade ELA scores, which means that our students of color have pneumonia. Okay, let's get a little bit more personal. Let's bring it down. Would you admit that the same predictability about scores that are centered around race can be predicted here in Charlotte? Yes? Same thing in math. Although when I look at your data, it, I can tell that you're striving in math and science and that there is still work to do around English language arts. Am I lying? Is that true? Okay. So you're learning some lessons about what it takes to get students academically prepared in mathematics and science. Okay. College and career ready? I don't throw this data up for us to gap gaze. There's a woman by the name of Rochelle Gutierrez, one of probably one of the most powerful pe people that I've read their research around uh, people of color and mathematics. She's out of the University of Chicago. One of the things that she warns us about is if you get so deep into the data, 
you forget why the data even exists. And what ends up happening is we start this cycle of called gap gazing where every single six to eight weeks you start spilling out assessment data and before the data even gets on the table, there are three things you can say that you know very well is going, that data is going to show. It's going to show what? That there is a, a gap by race and that nine times out of ten there's a gap by gender. And so Rochelle Guterres, she warns us, she says that, you know, it's sort of like um, you working out at the gym, right? And for some of us who happen to pop in and out, we know that those first couple of days back at the gym, our muscles are going to be sore. But we never really stop to ask ourselves why the muscles are sore. We just sort of accept it, right? And that's what ends up happening when we gap gaze because it's not just important for us to understand the data, we need to understand how, where the data came from. See, there's a reason why our systems of academia are broken in the United States. And I want to respectfully submit to you that part of those reasons have to do with institutionalized racism. Yes, I said it. Institutionalized racism. Turn to your neighbor and say, oh my gosh, she said it. Nine times out of ten, when I say institutionalized racism, and I mean this in the most loving way, my white colleagues start to stare straight ahead. Is she looking at me? No. Are you trying to say it's my fault? No. What I want us to do is have a conversation that institutionalized racism exists. And to ignore it means that we want to ignore the very problem that we are situated around. And unless we start to have these frank conversations, we're never going to get past that. So let's talk a little bit about that. What is this? It's redlining. Redlining has a historical presence in almost every community that we see. It's here in Charlotte. Communities are redlined, and those communities as they're being redlined, people of color, people of poverty were forced into those communities. The resources in those communities end up becoming drained. People aren't able to find jobs. Their education starts to lack. People in redlined communities, when you walk outside your door and you realize that you and your neighbors have all sat with your head in your hands, wondering how you're going to pay your bills, you have nothing else to look forward and look up to. So then starts the perpetuation of the pedagogy of the oppressed. And that is a real thing. And so this is a system, whether we realize it or not, that actually feeds into this. So let's have a real conversation. It's a system that feeds into this. There is still a perpetual unemployment rate gap that is persistent by race. And we see this time and time again. That is because there are institutionalized policies and practices that not only were upheld in some of our laws, but they end up becoming our cultural norms. They end up becoming who we are. They end up becoming communities, DNAs. It ends up becoming the smog that you breathe. Till pretty soon, you expect this. And so you as a school leader, to be asked to walk into a building and to lead a group of teachers and students, don't even realize how this plays out in you every single day. Oh sure, you say to yourself, I believe all students can learn, but then you go home and turn on the TV and you see this. Or, This, I have to admit, when I saw this, my jaw fell open. This is a racial wealth inequality. These numbers here simply mean the estimated wealth that a family has. I mean, it's preposterous. And it threw me back because I will tell you, <laughs> I am one of the most assimilated <laughs> system working sisters you will ever meet. <laughs> And to realize that I'm a part of this group, it becomes daunting. I 
I think I have to walk closer to the laptop for it to, to work. Let me see. The cost of an unskilled job versus a career. So in those same red line communities, who by the way the resources are zapped, who by the way the health department or the health of that community is zapped, who by the way the people stop believing in themselves, are then having to make a choice. Do I go in and I push to be a cost of an unskilled job versus a career? And guess what? We help them define that choice. When I was a school leader, all of this used to circle around in my head, and I used to go home at night, you know, if I'll be honest, open up a, a, a bottle of Cabernet. <laughs> and I used to say to myself, this feels like I'm throwing peas at a dragon. I've been asked to go in and to fight with no armor. And part of it was I disassociated what I was meeting at my schoolhouse every day from this, from the redlining, from the unemployment. Now, as my grandmama used to tell me, you got to focus on the things that you can change. And I want to respectfully submit to you that we can change this, but it starts in our schoolhouses. And that's not to say it's our sole responsibility. But we are responsible for a piece of it. Okay, they're getting quiet, Brian, so I'm going to have to wake them up. What does that mean? It means that the students that you graduated this year have a choice that they have to make. And then those choices that they have to make, everything that you gave them, everything that they picked up, everything that was withheld from them actually leaves out the door with them. And so when they go to make a decision, for instance, like joining our armed services, like being a part of the military, they have to take an aptitude test. And the results of that aptitude test predicts to them where their career is going to be in the military. So I want you to think about that for a second. My father was a part of the military. He was an Air Force. To be committed in the standing up for the safety and the rights of your country, only to have to sit and take an aptitude test that the very people in your country didn't prepare you for. You can clap, it's OK. Might be the only one in the back. <laughs> and the results of that aptitude test literally decides how far away or how close you become to the combat. Some people don't have that choice depending on the results of their aptitude test. Or it could mean you want to go to college. I don't know about you, I filled out a FAFSA form with a thesaurus and a dictionary. First of all, even if you have the fluency, even if you have the comprehension, there's a thing called perseverance that has to happen in reading. And I can't tell you how many young people I had to sit next to and they got through part A and B and was like, I can't do no more. Oh, yes, you can and you will. My mother used to tell me either you gonna do it on your own or you gonna do it with me dragging you. <laughs> but we don't even necessarily prepare our students to even fill out the form that will put them on the path to being college ready. What about if they decide, you know what, I'd like to buy a car or a home. I don't know about you, but the last time I went in to purchase a vehicle, I literally asked for them to give me the paperwork for me to go home. I had to look some words up on Google. And if you're, not care if you're not careful, you will sign up for a predatory loan for a Prius for 25 years. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the Prius drivers, I'm just saying. 
If you don't understand what compound, compound interest is, if you don't understand what your credit score and how it's affected and how they make the decisions and what percentage of a deposit that you put down, and that actually you can com combine as you're making your parent payments and actually drive down the interest if you're making higher payments and how all that falls out, if you don't have the computation in your head, or even understand that it's not just about buying a car, it's about understanding what you're signing up for. You could be placed in a loan that you yourself have no idea what you're about to embark upon. What about buying a house? Hello. All that paperwork they ask you to sign, hoping that you don't read the fine line. You know, by the way, if you don't make a mortgage payment, we coming to get your keys. I point all this out. Because it's important for us to have a conversation that even if we want to prepare our young people just to go out and to have and to live what we call just a normal way of living, it's incumbent upon us to understand that we have to prepare them. I had an opportunity, I talked about this in one of my keynotes, to read a, uh, to, to meet a, re, be reacclimated to a student of mine who went through my middle school. And I saw her one evening at a Friday's, and I was so excited to see her. And, and, and I joke because I say that, you know, I looked at her and was like, I don't understand how you are getting older and I'm getting younger. <laughs> but she was working as a waitress. And she was working as a sales associate at Foot Locker. And she was living in the same county that I was living in. And it hit me as we were talking and I asked her like, well, what are you doing and where are you about to go and are you in school? And she, each question, her face began to fall. And she said, Miss Robinson, you know I don't read that well. And she smacked me in the face in the reality that she was having to face that I knew that she was struggling in when she was in seventh grade. And in, in my county, in order for her to even live in a one-bedroom apartment, have a cell phone, drive a used car, be able to afford health insurance, she needed to make $34,000 a year. Which meant that I played a role in her cycle of poverty that she was hoping to get out of when she walked through my middle school. Because I yet to understand that the systems that I just pointed out to you were actually doing this. And the systems that I was creating in my building were doing this. And guess what? One system was doing nothing but perpetu perpetuating the other system. Instead of dismantling the system, I was actually adding on to it. And we're going to talk about ways that I noticed how it was being added on. So. If you're living a living wage, low income in limitations, a retail worker, which is what Shiloh was in, plus a cashier or wait staff, she was barely coming up with $20,000 a year. And the cost of housing, this really blew me. There are only 12 counties in this country where you could get a modest one bedroom home between 20 and $25,000 a year. And in those counties, because I researched some of them, if you don't have a car, you're in trouble. Because most of those counties don't have a public system, a transportation system. And so I want to talk to you today. I heard us talking about being a movement and causing a movement. I actually think we need to go from an evolution to a revolution. That's what we need right now in this moment of education. We need a revolution, and the revolution is going to start with us. Turn to your neighbor and say, she's talking about you. <laughs> so in order for us to have this conversation, we're going to lean on Glean Singleton. We're going to have to stay engaged. So you got some neighbors here already trying to signal out like, oh, Lord, here come another diversity and equity conversation. You need to start elbowing them. We're going to speak our truth, and I say speak truth with mercy, and this is what I mean by this. I'm not going to light foot around these subjects. I'm going to have mercy with myself. I'm going to call these subjects out loud that people wouldn't be willing to call out loud when I was moving through my school system. And I'm going to have mercy on you. For some of you, you haven't had this level of a conversation before, and so I am going to step on your toes. 
and I want you to have mercy with each other because some of you are going to walk out this room and you're going to want to carry this conversation and others of you are going to think this conversation is too heavy to shut down and you have to be able to push one another. You're going to experience some discomfort. You may have felt it already. And we're going to have to expect and accept that we're not going to reach closure about everything. These are our ground rules. We at Unbound Ed hold ourselves true to five charges. We believe that the road to social justice starts with adopting an aligned curriculum. Congratulations, Charlotte. You're on your way to there. Go ahead, clap it up. Let's see if you clap about this. <laughs> so there's an adaptive and technical work to adopting an aligned curriculum. We're going to get into that in a minute. You have to attend to the language of the standards. Write a note right now. Attend to the language of the standards. This is not your mom and pop curriculum solution. The standards that are aligned curriculum are created out of is not the norm. No longer are teachers able to crack open a lesson plan book or a curriculum document and read, okay, here's the lesson, here's the objective teacher said, no. They have to understand the grade level standard in which the lesson in the unit is built around and the anchor standard that the grade level standard is actually spiraling the students up to. And in order for them to be able to execute on the lessons and make decisions in the moment, they have to understand the language of the standards. Which means, guess who has to understand the language of the standards? Turn to your neighbor and say, you. <laughs> so if you haven't done this already, I'm going to ask. You might not be able to take time out to do it now. There's an app that has the standards. You need to look that app up and put it on your phone as a building leader. Because you need to be able to walk into a room and whether it's displayed or it's in the lesson plan or the teacher alludes to it, you need to be able to look up the standard that the teacher is facilitating the learning around and you need to be able to capture the verbs, the actions, what the students should be doing, which means you need to be able to, act to capture what the teacher should be doing in that lesson. We have to attend to the language of the standards. There's no other way around it. And let me tell you something. I go across the United States, and I have this back and forth all the time about the standards. <laughs> I was in Oakland, California, and uh, one of my colleagues that works in the schoolhouse raised his hand and said, Miss Robinson, you know the standards are the empirical work of the white man. I said, yes, and so is your paycheck. <laughs> and the truth is, if you want your students to succeed and be at least at the place where you are now, you are going to have to know the language of the standards. And let me tell you this, if you do believe that it is the empirical work of the white man, well, let's teach our students what the standards are so that they can succeed, so that they can gain access to the places where they're making the decisions and change the policies and practices so that 20 years from now, we're not saying the standards are the work of the empirical work of the white man. There's no other way around it. My mother had to make a decision as a single woman to decide to move into a low wage, predominantly white neighborhood because she decided, I want my children to be exposed to what other people's children have. And see, coming up and growing up in Akron, Ohio, as an African-American woman, she was only told she could do two things. You can clean white people's houses or you can become a beautician. And she did both until the military pushed my parents up and out and relocated them to California. And so my mother had made up in her mind, I want my children to be exposed like I see all these other families' children to be exposed. And if that means that they have to learn the language, the social responses, to get them in the door where they need to be, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. That's the same sacrifice we got to call out to our kids. It's not about 
exchanging yourself to be someone else. It's about acknowledging that as you move through your path in life, you are going to have to learn how to negotiate and show up as your whole self and never be blocked from it. And so on Sunday nights, she pulled out the fine dinnerware. She put on classical music. And she made us practice the language of assimilation, the dominant language of culture. Some people call it academic language. I actually spar with that. Because if it was academic language, it would be way more heavier in Latin than what it is now. But it's the assimilated language so that when people called the house and picked up the phone and I said, Robinson residence, this is Lacey, how may I help you? My mother never wanted them to assume who was on the other line. That became, this is a note, my language passport. But when I sat down at the table with my grandparents, we're going to talk about this in a minute, and we were having conversations about Miss Jenkins down the road and what happened at the church and can you believe that? And my grandfather would say something to my grandmother. And my grandmother would say, I ain't studying you. <laughs> I knew that language. And that language is my passport. We have to talk about race systematically. It is pervasive. It is, quite frankly, how this country was built. It does not have to be what we choose to become or to stay. We have to examine our own bias and role in our work and our learning, and we have to commit to adaptive change. And I'm here to tell you all, I don't know if they told you yet, but um, you all are adopting a curriculum, correct? Your teachers got immersed in the PD. If you haven't found it yet, you better go home and get you some armor. <laughs> because the adaptive change that has to come with, an adapt, with uh, adopting a curriculum is some serious, in the ground, lightsaber with your full armor on work. So I hope you take time this summer to rest up. And as my grandmother say, to learn up. Because your teachers are going to come back frustrated. They're going to they're gonna not know when they need to be pushed. And you are going to have to ride that wave with them and show them how the adaptive change has to go along with the technical change. So we're going to move a little bit in that. At Unbound Ed, we have an approach. It's, our learning is grounded in the intersection of standards, content, aligned curriculum, and equitable instructional practices that are essential for closing. It's not the academic gap. It is an opportunity gap that is caused by systemic bias and racism. We do this for these children. We do this so that these children will come back to your communities and will keep pushing and making a change. We do it because these children's parents did not have the same access that they're getting right now. We do this because these children, whether they realize it or not, were born into families with generational curses. That's right, I'm going there that unless we get them on the road, we'll continue to prevail in those generations' curses from generations from generation to generation to generation. I always have to show this picture. One, it's proof my mouth is always running. <laughs> Two, it's proof that I have, too, walked the halls. I have sat in the classrooms with my teachers. I've been held to a high esteem. That was Arnie Duncan, the former Secretary of Education. My middle school got blessed with a $6 million a year grant. And I'm here to tell you that the money made a difference, but it did not make the shift. Because the shift had to come not just from the technical things that we bought, but from the adaptive things that we needed to buy into. And so I inherited a school that had every single gap you could think of. It had an achievement gap. It had a discipline gap. It had an opportunity gap. It had an aspiration gap. And guess what? I wasn't talking about the students. That was the gaps of the teachers. <laughs> See, that's the real story that needs to be told. The gaps don't start with the kids. They start with the adults. Wait a minute. Now I'm about to step on the toes. The gaps start with you. That's why I said earlier, it depends on what your intent is. Why are you sitting in this, ro in this role? Why are you in this job? 
You got to start asking yourself these deep questions, because if you're not in this role to mitigate these gaps with your teachers first and then the students and then the community, you might need to go look for something else. We mark ourselves up against teaching by numbers. 3.8 million teachers are welcomed into our houses. 77% of them are women. That's an issue, and that is also on purpose. Our public education system was built to help women find things to do during the day. And unfortunately, that mindset has created an environment where our young men walk into buildings seeing very far few in between role models that even look like them. And I'm about to really get real, and it's okay. Tell your neighbor it's going to be okay. <laughs> Much of our practices are predicated around feminine virtues. The way we, we set up our classrooms, the expectations of communication, the way we ask for movement, there is a difference. I studied it for five years. Now, is it predictable for every kid? No. But can we acknowledge that communication can shift and change depending on who you are, where you were raised, what your gender identity is, what the expectations around your gender identity, all that stuff comes into play. When I was a second grade teacher, I used to lose my mind. Because I would be sitting there reading the book, going into all the characters, you know, and some of my students would be leaning in, tracking. Other students would be getting up, running around. The, and I'm like, what is going on? And I had a mentor come to me and say, baby, the boys are sitting too long. Guess what? And if the boys are sitting too long, your girls are sitting too long. So we have to re-examine what we call school and who we are actually building the school environment for. Is it for you? Or is it for the, folk, the children that are coming into your building? 20% of people of color are in education today. 20%, and that is not by accident. With the exception of Brown versus Board of Education, there was a, a very acute removal of educators of color. I read about it here in Charlotte. And that's a problem. As it was said earlier today, when your students push into your schoolhouses and they see very far and few between role models that look like them, maybe even perhaps come from the same community as them, that's a problem. And I will be the first person to tell you that as a building leader, oftentimes I went into my barber and beauty shops and begged people to come into my schools. Some of them, I was able to uh, glimmer and glamour and turn them into teachers and leaders. We have work to do behind this and we cannot wait for the policies and practices to trickle down from the government into our schoolhouses in order to change that number. So I respectfully submit to you, how are you increasing your educators of color in your building? It's going to be OK. <laughs> Our teachers spend 27 out of 45 hours preparing. Um, we're going to talk about that. Their lessons as compared to other countries. And I'm going to respectfully submit to you, what do you mean by preparation? That does not mean, I had to say this earlier to Brian, teachers pay teachers. And I got to tell you, if you have a building where you are noticing that your teachers are coming in unprepared to teach the lesson, instead of asking them to hand the lesson plan in, why don't you sit down and prepare a lesson with them? Yes. I go across schools across the United States all the time and I ask, how many people ask their teachers to hand their lessons in? That's a question. How many people ask their teachers to hand their lessons in? <laughs> They're like, she ain't talking to me. <laughs> I mean, I did it. Nobody else does it. Nobody else asked. Thank you. People, thank you in the back. Nobody else asked their teachers to hand. OK. And so I want to say, instead of handing in the lesson, why don't you ask them to hand in the math problems completed? So you can determine whether they really even understand the concepts in math that they're teaching. Why don't you sit them down and ask them to tell you what were the themes in the novel that they're presenting in this unit? 
What was their favorite part? What was the writer trying to do as they moved through each paragraph, sentence, and phrase? What kind of punctuation was used to get the point across of the main character? Instead of asking, are their lessons prepared, you need to ask, are you prepared for the lesson? See, we live in the United States where we are held at a high esteem as educators. We are held in the most highest of honesty and ethical standards. I mean, it's high up there. Nurses, military officers, and grade school teachers. And yet, we have fewer resources in classrooms, less respect, and less pay. And I like to point this out because Part of this revolution is us eradicating what it means to be an educator. We have gutted out what it means to be a professional in our schoolhouses. To be a professional means that I am consistently growing my knowledge against the knowledge that I've already acquired. So I'm going to ask you, make a note, what do you do to support the profession of teaching in your building? Do your teachers know that they are professionals? What messages are you sending them to let them know that I not only respect what you do, but I'm going to continuously feed into you because this is your profession? See, we accept our lawyers, our doctors. Who would go to a doctor who said, you know, I haven't seen something like this since I was in medical school? <laughs> what? And it's ironic to me that we work in a career track where we actually ask them to do the opposite as soon as we give them a job. Teachers spend time preparing, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because the preparation ain't all that great. But then we stick them in a classroom, we give them PD every once in a while, but we never check in on how their knowledge is building. And you make the assumption that your seventh grade math teacher understands all of the algebraic thinking and the concepts and the foundational concepts and skills of mathematics. And I double dog dare you to go to your seventh grade math teacher and say, what is subitizing? Okay, let me say it slower. Subitizing, it's a fun word. It's okay if you don't know it. Just don't look at your neighbor, they won't know it's you. <laughs> But if you are a seventh grade math teacher and you don't understand what supertizing is and how that plays into foundational concepts and skills about math, how do I expect you to teach these concepts to get these seventh graders into eighth graders into ninth graders and beyond? And if you haven't checked to see how your teacher's knowledge is growing, that is a problem. Now, here it goes. If you haven't checked to see how your knowledge is growing, that is a problem. So we have to commit that every student graduates with meaningful employment or higher education opportunities. I had an opportunity once to go to Northern Grumman, one of our military defense organizations. And I was shocked because they said, you know, Lacey, we have well over anywhere between 600 to 800 job openings and cannot find one applicant. And the applicants that we're looking for aren't even applicants that we are asking to come in with college degrees. They're applicants that we want to ensure that are ready to take on the certification that we have to qualify them in in order to get these jobs. And the average job that these applicants, if they were awarded, started at $80,000 a year. That don't mean some of y'all go and look for jobs in Northern Grumman. <laughs> but can you imagine for your student to exit out of high school with the certification that was pointed out earlier today and to be able to be accepted into a job at $80,000 a year, that is breaking a generational curse. So we need a revolution, a fundamental change in the way of thinking about or visualizing something. We need a paradigm shift. You all are marking yourselves for this paradigm shift. You're saying to yourselves that right now we're at 60% where our employers support the highest job satisfaction. We need to move to 75%. This isn't a happenstance. We have to create the environments so that people are brought in as professions, respected, pushed as professionals, 
so that they can go back and be net promoters. That means you're going to refer other people to work here. You do realize that your references to becoming an employment in CMS starts in your schoolhouses, right, with your children. Then if you stand in enough models, you will have kids that will exit out. They'll go away to college and come back and say, you know what, I want to be a teacher too. 71% right now, school-aged children in, in, in Mecklenburg attend a CM, CMS school. You're aiming for 75%. The more you grow the expectations of your professions, the more they grow the expectations of their students, the more the community will expect and come knocking on your doorstep. Because it is the most powerful weapon. And in this revolution, we have to ask ourselves, what is learning? Take one minute. What is learning? Jot it down. What is learning? What does it mean to learn? Some of you may have put down that it's constructive. It's how you build new senses, understanding of reality, and one's place within their reality. Some of you said it's active. It's social. And I submit to you that if it is social, how much socialization actually happens in a classroom where the children are seen and not heard, where they're faced and asked to sit in a row, where they're not, never asked to stand up, join a group, and where it's moved from just a group activity to a cooperative activity. Can I tell you what the difference is? So I witnessed something earlier today that we all do as adults. We create activities to form groups, right? You start off in a pair, then you get into uh, triads, then you get into quads, right? That's a group activity. You know the difference between a group activity and cooperative group activity? And see, I learned this actually in some of my travels that I've had across the world. And also I learned this because this is a principle uh, that we celebrate in Kwanzaa. See, a cooperative group activity means that every person in this group holds the responsibility of building the knowledge of the group. So when we get together in a group, I have the responsibility of the group of teaching, of teaching the group this. You have the responsibility of teaching that. The responsibility doesn't fall on one child. And if you are pushing more cooperative group activity, you as a teacher or even a leader can walk around and begin to then make assessments around who is gaining the understanding that the cooperative group activity is based around. Because learning is social. It's also all about context. It occurs in the learner's complex social environment. This is probably one of the most important pieces about learning. We all the time say, we want our students to have agency. We want our students to get into their learning. You have to build context. Sometimes that context comes from the perspective of the student and the community that they come from. Sometimes that context comes from calling out why it's important for the student to learn this. So many young people I get involved with, they like, well, why do I have to learn this algebraic reasoning? Or why do I have to learn about the Constitution and the laws? And I say to them, because, dear heart, this is literally life or death. There are people out there who literally are hoping that you never catch this concept. Because to catch this concept means that they can keep you out of their schoolhouses. And to keep you out of their schoolhouses means they can keep you out of their jobs. And to keep you out of their jobs means they can keep you out of their communities. And they can exasperate what's going on over and over again. Sometimes the context is merely saying to our students, yes, child of color, we live in a community that is not always going to respect you. But if I give you the tools, you will be invited to the boardroom and you will command respect. 
And so it's part of our responsibility to teach the context of learning to our students. And finally, it's about the actions of the learner. Now this is, I think, is very interesting because many of you walk into rooms and the teacher has the lesson laid out and the teacher is following the lesson and the teacher is asking the question and guess who's answering it? The teacher. And oftentimes I walk into third and fourth grade classrooms and I turn to my colleagues and say, she never went through third grade because she's the only one that's owning the learning. Very recently, I walked into a classroom with a bunch of students who were attending to a math lesson, and the teacher was talking about perimeter and area, and the teacher would ask a definition, and before a child could respond, she would give the definition back. Then the teacher moved on to teach them about the formulas to calculate perimeter and area, and as she was asking them, you know, what's the formula, she was giving them the answer back before they could even answer her. And as I picked my stuff up and I thought, okay, enough is enough, I'm going to walk out the classroom, a little boy grabs me by my arm and says, I just want to let you know we're not dumb. And the teacher didn't even realize that in that action of owning the learning is literally saying to the children before you, I don't believe you have the intellect to lift this concept. So write yourself a note. I want you to walk your buildings asking yourself one simple question. Who is doing the learning? Count the classrooms where there is no reciprocal exchange, not just teacher to teacher, but student to student. Because Part of learning is one of the reasons why we're all sitting in this room. Learning is addictive. Learning has a chemical response. It starts with our neurons. They chat and talk to each other. They use chemical messengers. And the chemical messengers are made up of, I already know this, <laughs> signals that come from the chemical dopamine. And who knows what dopamine does? It's that feel good, right? It's like when you ate that fried chicken, you were like, ooh, this is good. And the dopamine started firing off in your brain. That's what happens when you are learning something new. And it feels good. And then what you don't understand is that, you know that moment where you have that aha, like, oh my God, I finally got it? It's because the concepts have built upon the concepts and the concepts started merging together. And I will tell you that when I sat next to my grandmother at the age of 71 and she was learning how to read, I got addicted to watching that chemical exchange come out through her eyes and her mouth, how she sat up straighter, how she held the book, how she tracked her words, and I could feel it emanating from her body. And in that moment, my grandmother didn't just give me the gift of being able to sit next to someone as they were learning something, but she gave me the gift of understanding that I was being called to be a teacher because I wanted to be around that moment over and over and over again. And I will tell you that that moment, in order for that to happen in your classrooms, it has to happen in your conference rooms with your teachers. They have to have moments where their knowledge is being built upon and they're making those aha pieces and they're linking what they know about this author and how this author's life was lived to what is happening in the story and the themes that the author's trying to pull out. And they're linking what they know about writing techniques of argument so that they can then understand why the author's using this technique to put their point across. And when that starts to happen with your teachers, you will begin to see it overplaying in your classrooms. And in order for that to happen with your teachers, it has to start with you. So I ask you, what have you done as of late to fire off your neurons? It's not enough to ask a teacher just to hold to uh, rigor. Oh, that's actually not even me clicking. You're clicking, aren't you? OK. <laughs> it's like, dang, this thing has a delay. <laughs> if you told me that, I would just point to you. OK. <laughs> it's not enough to ask your teachers to ensure that rigor is in the classroom. In order for rigor to show up in your classroom, 
Your teachers need to be ready to ignite genius in others. That's what rigor is. And in order to do that, they have to have a thorough understanding of the concepts, the pedagogical content knowledge, the pedagogy, so that the word scaffolding doesn't become a cuss word. That the word scaffolding doesn't become a barrier in your classrooms. That the word scaffolding doesn't mean I take this fifth grader who reads on a third grade level and instead of giving them the fifth grade text, I'm going to teach them the theme through the third grade text because this is going to ramp them up. No, it's not. It's going to make them buffer in their third grade literacy rate. So in order to get your teachers to submit to rigor, you have to get them to understand the science and the art of reading. And what kind of scaffolding does it take for a student who might be fluent at a third grade level to get exposed to a fifth grade text? So they have to be ready to ignite genius in others. And you as a leader have to set up situations in your classroom where you're igniting them to do that, which means that you might have to have conversations that be go, be go beyond that unit of study. You might have to have conversations about the novels they're reading, the mathematical concepts. You might have to design your professional development that gets to the core of that unit. Instead of spending your days planning out the units of study, you might need them to study the units. Which means you might need to know what the units are. Which means that if you open up the curriculum and you see the themes falling out in this ELA unit for eighth grade and you have no idea what these themes mean, you might need to create a community that is ready to ignite genius in others. You might have to call on each other. Hey, you know, Mrs. McGillicully, I'm really good in math. You're really good at ELA. Can we get together and talk about this unit design in this ELA curriculum? You can't expect them to do it if you're not willing to do it yourselves. And I will say this. Let me tell you, as a building leader, I used to get so mad when people would say to me, well, you know, Ms. Robinson, you need to be a perfectionist in math and ELA. And I said, who got time for that? But what I began to understand was that I at least had to take the time out. I had to at least acknowledge the unit of study. I had to take the time out to learn how to unpack a standard so that no matter what grade level I went into, I could look for the verb, I could look for the action, I could see how the standard was building one thing on top of the other. I could know that the ELA standards actually spiral up and spiral down. I can know that the math standards are actually built off of one another. And if you get to a math standard that the student is struggling with, what I love about the mathematical concept map is that I can string it back to the concept that the student might have missed. But in order for me to know that, I had to join conversations. So your next question is that are you ready to ignite genius in others? You all saw this in your sessions. Students missing knowledge or skill and access to grade level tasks increased 7.3% more in months of learning. I'm putting this up because I'm going to tell you this right now. Ooh, I'm about to get, woo, I'm going to tell you, I want every person to mail me a dollar. Just kidding. Every time you hear this upcoming year, but these kids can. not But you don't know our kids. But what am I supposed to do? When Jamal comes in and he's a sixth grader reading on a second grade level. And you have to be ready to answer that. And not just shake your head and say, I know, Ms. Jones, you're right. Because I bet my bottom dollar there's something that Ms. Jones didn't know how to do. That Ms. Jones entered into classrooms and lecture rooms and had no idea what the professor was talking about and somehow, some way, made it through. And so you, are being, you need to be prepared to meet that. You need to be prepared that the curriculum that you are asking your teachers to actually implement, that the intention behind that curriculum nine times out of 10 is not going to be enacted the way that it should. You have to be prepared that your teachers are going to pull those lessons out of that curriculum and they're going to start marking out the questions and activities that they believe the students cannot do. 
without even trying it with them first, without even acknowledging. It's not that the student can't do the activity, it's that I don't know how to get the student to do the activity. Which means you have to create environments where your teachers can come into your office and shut the door and say, Miss O'Neill, I got something to tell you. I teach sixth grade math, and I don't understand a damn thing that's in that book. <laughs> that wasn't too bad of a curse word, was it? <laughs> It's called moving them from performance orientation to learning orientation. And until you can get your group of teachers to admit that they are meeting concepts and ideas and strategies that they have never heard of, we won't be able to eradicate this problem. So I want you to ask yourself, write yourself a note, how am I moving my staff from performance orientation to learning orientation? Turn to your neighbor 60 seconds and ask them that question. Is it because it doesn't work? I'm just gonna keep pointing to you. Okay. And if, unless you have another one. Oh, you changed batteries? Okay. Yep, that's you? Okay, go back. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to make note. If you or your neighbor's answer started with you, Because that's where it's going to begin. So let's talk a little bit about what this looks like. In ELA, we need to ask ourselves around how we're developing a unique lens to think through the role of language and equity. What does it mean, specifically as it applies to English language learners and students who speak English in a variant that is not recognized as culturally dominant. So I'm here to tell you that your bilingual students don't just come from other countries. Your bilingual students actually come from your neighborhoods. And what I mean by that is there are students who grew up, who were born in North Carolina, who have a vernacular about them that is not recognized in the academic houses, but it's still a vernacular and a language that should be respected. And that the same work that we do for all of our students who are acquisitioning into English, we have to do for all of our students who need to understand that there is a language passport that you move in and out of. And we need to understand that. Who speaks dual language? Raise your hand up high. Look around. I want you to understand the neurons that have to fire off for you to hear a language that is not your standard language and have to translate it and then give it back. That in itself should make you and your educators realize that we have children walking into our houses, into our schoolhouses that we discount because they don't speak English. And literally we're asking them to learn English at the same time where some of them are still acquisitioning to their own language. We're asking their neurons to fire off at a more rapid rate than our students who are only a monolanguage speaker. And if you have teachers in your building who believe that your students who are dual language students are walking into your building with a deficit, you might need to have that talk with them because they yet understand the intellectual capacity it takes in order to acquire a second language. 
And the fact that students show up day after day after day, wanting, expecting someone to help move them through that pathway, and they're looking at them like, oh, my poor, let me, let me come here. There's a such thing as loving somebody to death. There's a such thing as loving someone and not respecting them. We have to understand that we have to build the expertise teachers need to support students' access to and success with standards-aligned ELA curriculum. Internalizing and understanding that curriculum, that is going to be the sharpest uptick that this county is going to have to go through, is learning and understanding the curriculum. And I'm telling you, you're going to have people probably on day one and have probably already said you come to you and throw the curriculum on your desk and say, this is way too hard. We're actually creating barriers for the students. We're going to make our students feel like they don't know anything. And I always say, that's funny what that little book can do. <laughs> because they themselves haven't done the due diligence, and we have to create the environment for them to be able to understand the construct of the curriculum, why they're asking certain questions when, which way the questions are placed throughout the lesson. We have to lean on 30 years. This is really going to make some people mad, but that's OK. Lean on 30 years of research that supports the practice of systematic, explicit phonics instruction. <laughs> 30 years of research tells us you have to teach the students the code. There is a code to our language. And without that code, they will not succeed in their fluency, which means their comprehension will be lagging, which does not mean that they will not have the intellectual capacity to understand the themes um, that are coming out of the text. It just means they will struggle a lot more. They have to learn the code. And let me say this to you. If you have seventh and eighth grade ELA teachers that have no concept of the code of phonics, they need to know the code as well. Which means you might have to have some schools do some cross-pollination. Hey, kindergarten teacher, could you come to the seventh grade reading language arts hour and teach us what systematic phonics is? They have to know the code. Tell your neighbor that. The majority of children who enter kindergarten and elementary school at risk for reading failure can learn to read at an average or above average levels if they are identified early and given systematic intensive instruction in phonemic awareness, phonics, reading fluency, vocabulary, and reading comprehension strategies. So let me tell you what this means. You got to have a system of, uh, uh, of the code for kindergarten and first grade. Your kindergarten and first grade teachers should be experts in that. You know how you go to a specialist? Like if you had an ear infection, right, would you go see a foot doctor? No. You need your kindergarten, first grade, second grade teachers. They need to become the ear specialist when it comes to phonics. And if you have students that were, had unfinished learning about the code, and you notice that they're in fourth and fifth and sixth grade, here's the thing you have to really understand, that the remediation of reading should not happen during the classroom hour. Ooh, this is really going to strike some people. <laughs> Students should not have to be caught in between being exposed to grade level work and then having the practice of fluency. It's okay, all of them ain't clapping. They will by next year. <laughs> you have to build in that time. And for some of you right now, you're like, well, you don't know my schedule, and I don't have the resources, and what am I supposed to do without the teacher capacity? And I'm here to tell you that if we created this thing called the cell phone, you can come up with a bell schedule that has remediation in it. <laughs> Research has, research has also found that older struggling readers can indeed develop strong reading capabilities under the right instructional conditions. Let's hold it right there. The right instructional conditions. Not only should they be specialists in reading, not only should it be set aside time from their regular core 
uh, grade level instruction, but you have to have a teacher that opens up her reading instruction door and looks at every student and says, I don't care if you're in seventh grade and have the uh, reading fluency of a third grader. Not only do I believe that you can, I'm going to convince that you can, and I'm going to show you that you can. The agency has to start with the teacher in order for it to be developed with the student. And guess what? Whoever is in that child's life at home has to be pulled into the play of this. Do not make the assumption that they understand the importance because some of them have had to get by like my grandmother had to get by. But if nothing else, you need to be able to look at that person that has been called to hold the responsibility of raising that child, you need to be able to look them in their eye and say, Jamal's reading at a third grade level in seventh grade, but if you stick with me and if you work with me, we will not only get him to seventh grade, we will get him to eighth grade and beyond. The promises cannot come in a letter. Thank you. And by the way, some of y'all might not like this, but when you invite them to your schoolhouse, please don't ask them to dress a certain way. Some people come with the best they got. And if you want them to dress differently, you be the role model. <laughs> Principles for language equity learners, we can flip through this really fast because I want to get to this video. You can go ahead and, and hit it. Language and equity learners, we're the gatekeepers of academic language. We hold it against our students. That's the other thing that cracks me up. We don't know what a, our students don't know what a participial phrase is, and we hold it against them. And some of you all can't even spell participial, but that's a whole bunch of other things. <laughs> we must provide students with well-structured, intentional opportunities for collaboration that amplifies academic language. We have to pur purposely set up conditions in our classroom where we show them how the language passport should be moved in and out. Academic English proficiency is critical for our students. We must model academic language, provide instruction using grade level complex text. Because oftentimes, here's what happens in a classroom. Oh, there's no sound. You should see them scurrying back here. They're going to get it together. <laughs> it's okay. Take your time. Could be the buffering. All right. We can't get it to play. That's all right. I can reenact it. That's okay. I can reenact. <laughs> Moses is in a classroom where he's being asked to understand a mathematical concept of which he actually understands it. But he does not have the academic language. Who's seen this video? You need to play it to any and everybody who comes in your schoolhouse. And if you notice, what I love about this video is that the teacher yet understands what she doesn't understand. And she's just doing the best that she can. And there's a moment in the video where the teacher goes to the principal and she, you, she can tell she don't know what she's doing. <laughs> and she's literally begging through her actions to the principal, show me what it is I need to do because I know that this student is smart and can succeed. What she's literally saying is, don't make the assumption that I have the tools and strategies to support this student, even though they're placed in my classroom. And I respectfully submit to you that when you find teachers like that, we oftentimes get frustrated. We want to pair them up. You actually need to come up with a professional development plan for that teacher. All teachers need, are you ready for this, an IEP. All teachers should be identifying the areas that they need to work on and improve in, the areas where they might have weaknesses, where other folks might need to come in and support them. And until we create schoolhouses where we can have that conversation, we're going to keep perpetuating the same issue. 
And I got to tell y'all, the things I'm talking about, it didn't happen for me. I don't know if it happened for you. It didn't happen for me in my teacher preparation or when I was a school teacher because my leader was only doing the best thing that she knew how to do. But as Maya Angelou tells us, when you know better, you what? Okay. Why? Teachers and students face a dilemma that is stitched into work. Should they aim low, expecting modest results in return for some success, or aim high, risking resistance? and failure in hope of more impressive accomplishments. Failure is feedback. When students fail assessments, test assignments, that is actually feedback for the teacher to say, where's your gaps? It's feedback on how to get better. Not just you didn't do your homework, you didn't read the assignment, you weren't paying attention in class. See, those are the excuses that lift over that actually grow into these students can. When we really should be asking, why haven't I tried? We're going to turn it into a math oh, now, problem and we're going to walk through play. it together, okay? <laughs> it's just like a classroom. Video starts one minute before the bell. You can go to the next slide. So the boy ran three blocks. <laughs> so everyone write three blocks. Will it click? How long did it take him to run? It won't even click? Michelle? There we go. Very good. Six minutes. Couple more. In math, we have to develop conceptual understanding of grade level standards for all students. Six minutes. And we have to create logical just in time adaptations for all learners. Next slide. We have to design and implement norms and culture of a classroom to deliberately disrupt the societal positioning and patterns of interaction. I'm going to talk to you in a minute about these discretionary spaces that happen in the classroom when a teacher is asking a question to a student and the way that a student is choosing to respond and how the teacher responds back to the student. Yes, Enrique. We have to assign competence to students in ways that disrupts the hierarchy of and signals who is being smart or good. If you're walking into your teacher's classrooms and they're saying, oh, Peter back there, he's the smartest okay. one in the room, you need Does to say, to I need you to 40? meet me after school. Not in the parking lot, in your office. Yes, Moises. We need to develop conceptual understanding of math. And that development of conceptual understanding at a level of standards for all students when the standards call for it. Yep, that's right. Very good. You really need to understand Great. the way those math concepts math? work one in the other. Yep, very good. But Maybe when we start to hire our math teachers, we ask the math teachers to not only do the problems they're going to meet with the students, but we ask the math teachers to explain the concepts behind the problems before we give them the jobs. See, there's an issue that we have here in the United States around teacher preparation. Teacher preparation has yet to catch up where we want our students to be. They know it. I go and talk to them all the time. And so what ends up happening is we get cohorts of teachers that come into our schools who they say that are prepared and yet to even begin to understand what it means to be prepared as a teacher. And now it's incumbent upon us to create their what? Their IEPs. <laughs> Next slide. So what are the barriers? Deborah Ball, one of my heroes, talks all the time about discretionary spaces. I want you to walk into your rooms and I want you to notice how the teacher's interacting with the students. I want you to notice who the teacher is calling on. I want you to notice how he or she is positioning themselves in the classroom. I want you to notice that are they always standing up front? Are they asking a question and stepping off to the side? I want you to notice that when the students answer the question, what is the teacher's move? Is the teacher affirming, confirming, or are they allowing the student to circulate among student to student to grapple with the answer that they've given? See, that's all a part of learning. And unfortunately, we all get into this career and we forget what it takes and what it means to learn. And when you notice that your teachers are struggling in this, I want you to make a plan on how you're going to support them or make a plan that you walk into other people's classrooms and you can tell that they understand what the discretionary space is and how to use it and how they react. And here's the big one, how their bias starts to bubble up. Because the expectations that you have for a student starts with your concept of who they are. Next slide. Keep going. 
Our low expectations turn into self-fulfilling prophecies, and you want to know why your students don't have agencies, and why they're not getting into the work, and why they seem that they're not interested. It's because we are not interested in them. And, all right, here it comes. Keep going. Keep going. Because now I really want to give it to them. Keep going. Keep going. Keep it moving. Go. More. More. Go back. Go back. <laughs> One more. We don't even realize that we're creating these pipelines. We don't even realize, and I didn't realize this, as a seventh and eighth grade building leader with over a thousand kids that when I asked my kids to walk in a line with their hands down by their sides, I was really instituting the juvenile practice. When I expected my scholars to come in and dress a certain way, I was institutionalizing them. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with uniforms. I'm saying what is your expectation of the uniform? Go ahead. I had to realize that in order to achieve educational equity, we, I had to address my own bias. My own bias came through these three lenses. The assimilationist lens. My mother asked me to, and she grew me up, to turn myself into a white woman. And although I couldn't chameleon myself, I assumed that if I assimilated out of my culture into the white dominant culture, that that's how I would succeed, not realizing that on a daily basis I was saying to myself that I wasn't good enough. And so I ask you respectfully, are you asking your students to enter into the building looking like, sounding like, and acting like just like you? Or are you accepting them for who they are? A metocritus lens. It's all about the grit and pulling yourself up. And some of us forget not having the boots, forget not having the bootstraps. Even when you pull yourself up, there are things that happen in our society that push you back down. And it doesn't matter how much grit you have, you're not going to be able to grasp that social economic status until we begin to change the paradigm in the United States. So telling students if you just get down and try hard is not enough. You're going to have to get down and try hard with them. Colorblind lens. A lot of this is for my white colleagues. Please don't tell me you don't see color. Because to tell me you don't see me as a black woman erases 80% of who I am. Next slide. We have legacies and layers and lens. Next slide. Decades of education reform click all the way through this. I just show this point to show you that we actually have policies and laws in the United States that was predicated off of race. Who was being taught? Who was not being taught? Who was being oppressed? Who was not being oppressed? And as soon as one law got extinguished, or one rule got extinguished, or one uh, societal norm got extinguished, like slavery, another one popped up like the pig laws. You don't know what the pig laws are, research them. For some African Americans, even after they were released out of slavery, to walk on the right hand side of a sidewalk could cause them to get arrested and placed in that prison pipeline. And trust me, even though we don't call them pig laws, there's still a pig law concept going on in the United States. Where you can't even use your own condo key to enter into a pool area and go swimming without somebody calling the police. <laughs> Next slide. Click through it. Jim Crow, forced schooling of Native American indigenous children. Free public school, free for who? Who is it free for now? No child left behind, a nation at risk. Keep going. All of these are circumvented with our layers that we bring in. All of us and your teachers and our community have all of these layers underneath that show up as behaviors and interruptions. So when the teacher said these students just can't, it could be built off of some of the core values they got growing up themselves. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Move it on. These lenses, one more time. are what perpetuate, go back, white privilege. Everybody, every white person, whether you want it or not, rich or poor, you have it. 
But the opposite or the counterpart to white privilege is internalized racism. And I'm going to say this to my sisters and brothers of color. If you don't think you have internalized racism, see me after this. It is impossible to be in these United States and receive the messages that we hear on a daily basis. You're not good enough. You're not bright enough. You don't work hard enough. You look funny. You smell funny. You're half human. That we don't start to, those images and things don't start to seep into our brain and we have internalized racism and we begin to think because I made it through college, I got a job, I learned the King's English, I have multiple degrees, I drive a Lexus, why can't you? And sometimes, myself, I have to push against my internalized racism so that when I saw the body of Eric Green laying in that road, my first thought was, well, why was he trying to sell cigarettes? And then my second thought was, shut up, because he was trying to survive. It's a real thing, and it's the counterpart to white privilege. And I have to tell you this, there is a such thing as white fragility. Some of you all are having those moments right now. Will she just shut up saying race and equity and institutionalized racism? It's not to make you feel bad. It's to call the thing the thing. Because whether or not you believe it, whether or not you think it's junk science, for some of us it is a reality of what we live every single day. And to choose to ignore that reality is to choose to ignore us and the circumstances that we have to go through to even make it into the cars, to get into the parking lot, to walk into the schoolhouses. But guess what? People of color have fragility too. Because we made it this far, I don't need you to remind me all the time that we came out of slavery. I'm not one of them. My parents went to college. Nobody in my family smokes crack. And I have to respectfully say to you, move through your fragility. There is a real thing as racialized bias and social emotional trauma. You all talked about trauma this morning. Let's get down to the heart of what some of this trauma is coming from. That any time our children can turn on the television and know that somebody entered into a church and killed them just because they were black sitting with their Bible open, that causes social emotional trauma. But we can't have these conversations unless you're willing to walk through it. Are you willing to walk through it? Yes. Are you willing to have your staff walk through it? We have this thing on our website called the Bias Toolkit. I'm going to ask you can download it for free as part of our open educational resources. It's one way to start to have these conversations. I watched a school community in Baltimore City where at the beginning of the school year they had an aligned curriculum. They had a teacher that was teaching first grade. The teacher spent 80% of the instructional time telling the teachers, slant, sit, slit your head, oh, put it in the pit. She kept calling out all these commands to make sure that the kids were behaving and never got to the reading that was on the page. But after sitting with us, her coach not only taught her the standards, not only taught her expectations, they started having conversations about the bias that was coming into her classroom. And she had to admit she was afraid of the students. And the more she used control over them, the less afraid she was. But she took up so much time trying to control them, she forgot them to teach them how to read. So when we came back in the spring and she faced her own biases, I walked into a classroom and tears welled up in my eyes. Every student had a book open. Every student was tracking the story. Students were talking to each other. I didn't hear slant, star, snap, chat, none of that. She didn't have to. Why? Because 99% of their time was focused on their academic learning and not their behavior. Next slide so we can round this out. In order to achieve educational equity, we have to address our own biases. Keep going. We have put ourselves in a burning house. And Dr. King called us on that. And the only way to extinguish the fire is to start with ourselves. Keep going. We got to rebuild awareness of cultural responsive pedagogy. That does not mean playing Drake as they are doing their math assignments. <laughs> Ensuring that my cultural responsiveness has not been defined by the systems and instead is dismantling the systems. Write yourself a note. Am I dismantling the systems or am I recreating them? Keep going. Move it. More. 
One more. Keep going. You have to commit to doing this with your teachers. They come in unconscious and competent. They have to move to conscious and competent, conscious competent until they get to mastery. How are you doing this? Two more slides and I'm done. One more. Actually, no, 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 go back. I won't do the revolution poem. This number one, I want us all to pay close attention to. We believe that all students of color, especially African American and Latino young men, are assets to society and important members of the human family. I have a young son. We choose to educate him in another country. And when he comes over here, I have to let him know as soon as he lands, there's a target on your back. You're not seen as a commodity here. You're seen as extinguishable. And the only way to be able to circumvent that is for me to push you through school, for me to get you in the boardroom, and for me to get you to change the policies and the practices. It is a real thing. Our boys are in trouble. Knowing and valuing all members of the human family, reject any narrative that is degener degenerates people and prejudice one against each other, and we are committed to working with others. Last slide. We need a revolution. And I'm asking that the revolution starts here, starts now, starts with you. Thank you. <laughs>